it's a pleasure to be here today and talk to you about um, the new guidelines for high quality peritoneal dialysis that were developed by the International Society of Peritoneal Dialysis. And I think this is a particularly important topic now because this presents a real challenge for us in the United States and States kidney disease environment. I'm gonna start by presenting a case, a widowed 84 year old male who lives alone with ischemic renal disease, a history of coronary artery disease, congestive heart failure, peripheral vascular disease, has been on PD for two years and has done well. He started on incremental PD, initially two 2000 cc exchanges per day, and more recently three exchanges per day. He has gradually lost some residual renal function, but, K but remains with a renal KTV of 0.68. Total KTV, the sum of the renal and PD, has gradually decreased from 2.2 to 1.6. Albumin level is 8.3.8, .8. hemoglobin is 10, phosphorus is 5. His blood pressure and volume status are well controlled. His major complaint is fatigue, particularly in the morning when he has difficulty getting up and getting started with daily activities. What should we do with his management at this point? And I give you five choices. We can train him on the cycler, add a fourth exchange per day, both of these will increase the KTV over the targeted dose of 1.7 mandated in the United States now. We can continue with the current treatment regimen. We can transfer him to hemodialysis, or we can increase his erythropoietic stimulating agents and target a hemoglobin of 11 to 12. So we'll come back to this case presentation at the end and rediscuss what the choices are for his management. The new ISPD guidelines have really focused on patient-centered care and personalized medicine, because this is really the focus in healthcare delivery around the world now, in which we try to understand each patient's experience and goals, recognizing that each individual is unique with the appropriate adaptation of therapies rather than conforming to standard algorithms of care. So we really don't want to take a global bird's eye distance view of our patients. We want to focus on the individual patient on perineal dialysis or hemodialysis. And this was very well captured in this quote by Rita Sharon, who's the chair of the Department of Medicine, Humanities and Ethics at Columbia. And she says, in medicine, we get very good about talking about the human body, but we get dumber and dumber about paying attention to the individual. So that brings us to the ISPD guidelines for practicing high quality PD. The ISPD was very concerned about the varying practice patterns globally, particularly in the United States where the practice of PD is very different than it is in very many high income countries. So the ISPD convened a group of international experts to develop a roadmap for the practice of high quality PD. Importantly, the ISPD recognized that the focus of healthcare has now shifted globally to an emphasis on the individual patient rather than rigid adherence to arbitrary standards of care. And these guidelines are now published in PDI and they're available for free on the ISPD website. So the ISPD is reflecting really changes that have happened in a variety of areas. For example, I'm gonna give you an example from the world of art now. So the Guggenheim Museum in New York last year had a very interesting show where they invited five artists from around the world to comment on the new trends in art. Where was art headed in the future? And I wanna quote these two quotes from Richard Prince, who's a contemporary American artist who appropriates photos from advertisements in the past, such as the one shown on the bottom of the slide. And Richard Prince states that art witnesses and demands accountability, but it also envisages the possible. In art history, written from a global perspective, must acknowledge the myriad and diverse voices of the individual and the poetic and miraculous inventions of each of these individuals. In other words, recognizing the importance of the individual. So this brings us back to high quality PD again and, and the ISPD guidelines. So the ISPD has followed what Richard Prince has just outlined. And it says that PD should be prescribed using shared decision-making between the person doing PD, their caregivers, and the care team with the aim of achieving realistic care goals to maximize quality of life and satisfaction for the individual, 
minimize their symptoms, and provide high quality care. Importantly, PD can be prescribed in a variety of ways and should take into account local resources the person wishes regarding lifestyle and the family and caregivers' wishes. So what has happened in the United States now? Importantly, what we have not done is shown on the left-hand panel here. We have not focused on individual patient needs. We, routine, we have not routinely assessed in a meaningful way patients' goals, aspirations, and health-related quality of life. We have not tailored and adjusted therapy based on the assessments of individual patients' needs and goals and on the basis of large-scale clinical trials. What we have done, though, is focus on ESRD care in aggregate, not focus on patients' goals or incorporate HRQOL assessments and patient-reported outcome measures into routine clinical care. Rely on big data to direct patient practice patterns. And we've relied on the practice guidelines established by the large dialysis organizations and CMS. So our practice patterns have been dictated by these guidelines rather than by the individual patient, him or herself. So let me give you an example. On the left-hand panel, I showed the way one of the large dialysis organizations evaluates the standards of care provided in PD units. On the right-hand panel is shown the quality improvement program, the reimbursement guidelines from CMS, and those factors which contribute to these evaluations. On the left-hand panel, you can see that none of them have to do with the individual patient. They're just arbitrary standards of care based on laboratory findings, for example, um, the administration of vaccinations and education, et cetera. And on the right-hand side, the only evaluations that have to do with the patient are the CAP survey, which really simply deals with satisfaction with care provided by the dialysis facility and an annual depression and pain screening, which really doesn't make much sense because depression and pain scores vary um, frequently over time. So just doing this once a year really doesn't provide much in the way of an assessment of, of a patient's health-related quality of life. But importantly, if you look at the study that was just published this year in HAKD, looking at how the quality improvement program scores correlate with mortality rates, for example, you can see that when the scores get between 60 and 100, there is no difference in mortality rates, no difference in outcome measures. So what is it that we're actually measuring when we look at these measures for the quality improvement program? What does this tell us about our, the care we provide for the individual patient? So healthcare really has been changing and it's really been focusing on patient priorities and aligned decision-making. And I wanna give you three examples. The first one is by a paper published by Mary Tinetti in Chamberlain Internal Medicine in 2019. Mary is chair of the geriatric program at Yale. This was a non-randomized clinical trial of 366 patients with three or more comorbidities cared for by providers focusing on patient care priorities and those providing usual care. Importantly, there were significant improvements in healthcare, reductions in treatment burden and unwanted healthcare in those receiving care focused on the individual patient care priorities. And I'll just give you the one example on the treatment burden questionnaire, there are significant differences between those patients receiving the patient prioritized care and the standard care. And the editorial that accompanied this article by Margraves states the following, that too often we see patient care focused on labs such as hemoglobin and hemoglobin A1C that are generic, designed to improve the healthcare team's performance measures, disconnected from the realities and complexities of the patient's situation. And I'd like to suggest that this is what we are now doing in the care we deliver to our dialysis patients. Second study is on diabetic guidelines. This is a study of 836 randomly recruited patients over 65 years of age with diabetes and how they perceive factors used in guidelines for diabetic care. Many older adults, this is the conclusion of the paper, did not place high importance on factors recommended by guidelines. And in fact, many older adults weighted various factors in the opposite direction than the guidelines. And this is captioned in the study in older CKD patients. 
where the Adur looked at 382 patients with advanced CKD stages four and five, greater than 60 years of age, who were asked if you had a serious illness, what would be important to you? Only 20% opted for live, live, live as long as possible. But the most common responses were 35% do not suffer and 35% want care to focus on comfort. Again, we're separating the individual patient concerns from the standard measures which we use to assess outcomes. That brings us back to the ISPD guidelines and the recommendations for high quality perineal dialysis. What's clear in these guidelines is they're asking that we have a holistic approach, that the high quality PD prescription should be guided by a number of assessments encompassing various medical issues, as well as a patient's well being and life participation, a truly holistic approach. And this should then include the things shown on the right hand side blood pressure, nutritional status, anemia, bone and mineral metabolism, um, up and importantly, other areas of difficulty, comorbidities the pre-D prescription and small cellular clearance and patient goals and objectives and health-related quality of life. So I wanna focus on these last two. Assessing health-related quality of life in, in patients on dialysis is very complicated and important. And in a paper that um, I published with Marjorie Fu and PDI, which accompanied the ISPD publication on high quality PD, we outline what are the major areas of difficulty of patients maintained on perineal dialysis. And there's a whole host of these. And assessing this on a routine basis is challenging. But importantly, each patient will have individual concerns and individual domains of difficulty. Our job is to understand what are the domains of difficulty these patients have, and then make sure we address them as well as we possibly can so that the patients feel as well as they can and can achieve their goals and objectives. I want to talk a little bit about the pre-D prescription, and this is important. So this is a busy slide. There's a lot written on it, but I think it's important that we go through this to understand this carefully, because this has gotten a lot of attention in the United States. So small cellular clearance should be routinely measured using K2V urea or creatinine clearance to provide a quantitative measure of dialysis delivered. But importantly, we have to need to, we need to recognize the limitations and of the accuracy of these measurements. This is clearly recommended by the ISPD. And they go on to say that there is no specific clearance target that guarantees sufficient dialysis. Increasing small cellular clearance to a K2V greater than 1.7 may improve uremia-related symptoms, but there is only low certainty evidence showing that increasing urea clearance has any impact on quality of life, technique survival, or mortality. Importantly, if symptoms, nutrition, lab values, and volume are all controlled, no P descriptive change is needed for the sole purpose of reaching the arbitrary clearance target. And for some individuals, particularly those who are old, frail, or have a poor prognosis, there may be a quality of life benefit from modified dialysis prescription to minimize the burden of treatment. The burden of treatment in this model plays an important role in determining what the PD prescription should be. So in the paper discussing the dialysis clearance targets, they review the summary of the studies which look at the outcomes related to KT of the V. And there are actually very few studies that do this. There are only two randomized controlled trials and four observational trials. But the inclusions for all these is actually very similar. I wanna just review for you briefly the two randomized controlled trials. The first is the YK low trial that was um, done in Hong Kong. This is a randomized trial of 320 CAPD patients recruited between 1996 and 1999. Um, the usual initial prescription was three two liter exchanges per day, and they excluded patients who had a renal K to be greater than one. The average was a renal K to be about 0 0.35 but they targeted three different doses. Group A had a KTV of 1.5 to 1.7, group B had a 1.7 to 2, and group C had a KTV greater than two. And the right-hand panel shows the outcome in terms of mortality. Importantly, importantly, there's no difference in mortality in each of the three groups. The only difference was that the group A patients with the lowest KTV had more symptoms and more patients were withdrawn from the trial by the physicians caring for them because of symptoms that they attributed 
to the um, low clearance rates achieved with dialysis. The Adamix trial was the randomized trial done in Mexico um, and was reported by Paniagua and Jason in 2002, where the patients were randomized to a higher KTV of 2.2 and a lower dose of 1.8. The left-hand panel shows there was no difference in mortality rates. And the right-hand panel looks at quality of life measures and there was really no significant difference in terms of the physical composite score in the SF36, although the patients to the lower case today seem to have slightly better scores. But in other measures of quality of life, there were no differences between the two groups. So thus, the ISPD recommends that the dialysis targets should not be rigidly fixed at a case to be of 1.7 as we do in the United States, but the, the target needs to be flexible based on the treatment burden for the patients, the amount of solute clearance, patient symptoms, and how patients are doing in general. And they recommend in, in this table from the paper that um, factors that may support an increase in dialysis clearance include clinical features, patients aren't doing well, reductions in kidney function, biochemical abnormalities, but this is then individualized for each individual patient and there aren't fixed arbitrary criteria which one needs to follow. But importantly, there are real limitations to the accuracy of KTV measurements. And this was nicely summarized in the paper by Simon Davies and myself um, that was also published in PDI in the issue that dealt with high quality PD. And in this article, we emphasize the following, that body composition varies in terms of percent muscle mass and fat. Remember that fat has very little water, muscle has a lot of water. So body composition becomes important in deciding what the volume measurement we should use is. The formulas for estimating body water, such as those routinely used to calculate k to d may be inaccurate in patients on dialysis. And thus relying on an estimation of V to assess the adequacy of small solute clearance may well be misleading. In other words, there are real limitations to the measurement of k t of e, and utilizing that to determine the dose of dialysis will lead to um, sort of uh, dialysis regimens, which may not be in the best interest of individual patients. So that brings us now to um, the Health and Human Services and President Trump's campaign, which I'm sure everyone's familiar with, Advancing American Kidney Health Initiative, and the three goals that he outlined in 2019. Now, I think these goals are going to be kept in place when Biden assumes the presidency in January. So these are reducing the number of Americans developing end-stage kidney disease by 25% in 2030, doubling the number of kidneys available for transplant, and importantly, having 80% of new ESKD patients on in 2025 either receiving dialysis at home or receiving a kidney transplant, which will require a marked expansion of the number of patients on home dialysis. But is that a realistic goal? So this is data from the USRDS showing the percentage of dialysis patients maintained on peritoneal dialysis um, in the United States, where it's about nine to 10%. In many other high income countries, Canada, the UK, Netherlands, Norway, Australia, 25% of the patients maintained on home dialysis. And the question we need to ask ourselves is why is the percentage so much lower in the United States than in these other countries? And what do we need to do? What changes do we need to implement to increase that percentage of patients on home dialysis. So this shows what's happened recently with a number of patients on dialysis and transplants in the United States. The upper left-hand panel shows that there's been a continuous increase in patients on hemo, transplants on peritoneal dialysis. You can see there's been an uptick on the patients on PD and that's expanded in the lower right-hand panel. You can see this number really starts to increase in about 2010. Um, but that's when the bundle went into effect, where it was clearly um, financially advantageous to have patients on perineal dialysis when the bundle reimbursement system goes into effect. So the number of PD patients expands, not because we thought PD was a better therapy, but because there are financial advantages. So this is something we need to think about carefully as we look at the percentage of patients maintained on home dialysis and what we need to do to expand that number. So what is a reasonable target? And I'd like to just show you the data from the Ontario Home Dialysis Initiative from 2012 through 2019. And this slide was lent to me by Peter Blake on the Ontario Renal Network. They have made a major effort in Ontario to expand home dialysis programs, both home hemodialysis 
and peritoneal dialysis. But they've only been get up, able, able to get up to about 25 to 26% of dialysis patients maintained on home therapies, the vast majority on PD, as shown in this slide. Getting much above these numbers has proved to be very challenging despite a major effort by the government and by the nephrology community to expand PD. But this would be perhaps a reasonable target that we could shoot for in the United States. But we're nowhere near those numbers. So what is it that we need to do to have PD grow? And I'll give a bunch of suggestions here and let's go through these um, briefly. One, to expand the funding and provide additional support for CKD education. Secondly, provide support for multidisciplinary low clearance clinics to integrate CKD education as an essential part of care. Third, mandate that nephrology training programs provide a comprehensive education for fellows in PD. Four, restructure the government and dialysis facility regulatory requirements for home dialysis programs to focus on the patient experience, individualizing goals of care rather than meeting arbitrary predetermined standards of care. I'd like to suggest to you that the government and dialysis facility regulatory requirements now have had a major inhibitory role on the expansion of perineal dialysis in the United States. We need to permit the flexibility in PT programs to develop true patient-centered delivery of care, not focus on these arbitrary standards, but focus on the individual. We need to emphasize and underscore the quality of life of PD versus HD and remove financial disincentives for PD. And lastly, we need to support the development of assisted PD programs for frail elderly patients, something that has been done in many European countries and Canada and has really contributed to the expansion of PD in these countries. So let me conclude with two last slides. I wanna go back to the case that we presented at the beginning. What were our choices? So the choices to manage in this patient are not, 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 not to increase the KTV by adjusting his dialysis regimen. He's an 84 year old male living by himself. The burden of care needs to be taken into account. His main complaint is fatigue and getting started with his daily activities. Why wouldn't we sh sh tick choose the last choice here? Simply increase his erythropoietic stimulating agent and target a hemoglobin of 11 to 12 and see if that improves some of his symptoms. We do not need to modify his regimen, dialysis treatment regimen, to simply arbitrarily de deliver a KTV of 1.7. And I'd like to conclude with one more art painting. And this is one of my favorite paintings by Edward Harper called The Room by the Sea. It's in the Yale Art Gallery. This painting was discussed very, uh, very wonderfully by John Walsh, who was the chief curator at the Getty Museum in Los Angeles and now is an adjunct professor at Yale. Um, and his description of this Edward Harper painting, which you can find on YouTube in a series of lectures on paintings from the Yale Art Gallery are the following that you walk into this painting and you're confronted by a white wall. You have only two choices. You go to the left or you go to the right. If you go to the left, you go into a, a room that has stifling conformity to it, which is the way we practice dialysis now. We conform to guidelines outlined by the government and by the large dialysis organizations. There's no room for movement. It's stifling conformity. Or we can go to the right and go out that door. And what happens if you go out that door? That becomes an adventure into the unknown. We can now decide we'll try to reform patient care, focus on individual patients, not adhere to arbitrary guidelines, and use this as a way of improving the quality of care of our patients and expanding PD utilization nationally. Thank you. <laughs>